What if you could design an avatar? What would be their story? Maybe you could generate a theme song for them, or create a 3D model of them to explore a virtual world. This is the power of generative modeling. If we can learn a probability function, we can use it to generate images, music, and even 3D objects. Hello world, it's Siraj, and machine learning in 2019 has gotten really good at generating data. Some of these techniques are truly mind-blowing. NVIDIA, for example, was able to generate an entire 3D map for a video game automatically. In this episode, we'll learn the basics of generative modeling, then use that knowledge to build three apps that each generate music, images, and 3D objects, respectively. And anyone can get these up and running since the code lives in the cloud via Google Code. Lab. You don't even need to install anything on your local machine. Links to each demo will be in the video description. There are a lot of different ways that we can categorize the machine learning process. Does it have a label? Does it not have a label? Does it apply to simulated environments? Does it blend? These are great frames. They help us understand the techniques we should use given the type of data we're dealing with, but a more application-centric frame is, does it generate or does it discriminate? To paint a better picture here, let's say we have a labeled data set of integers. X is the input, Y is the output. A discriminative model would want to learn the probability of Y given X. In probability theory, we define this as a conditional relationship since one variable depends on another. Independence is overrated AF. So if we iterate through each data point and check if given that X equals one, what's the chance that Y equals zero? It's 100% for the first data point and 100% for the second. So the total is 100%. Now, how about when we're given x equals two? If we iterate through those data points where that's a given, we'll find that only half of them have y equals zero. Thus, the probability is one half. Now, a generative model is one that will instead learn the joint probability distribution of a data set. That is the probability of x and y. And this will output different values than the previous probability distribution. If we take the case of x equals one and y equals zero, we'll find that these both occur together twice out of the whole data set. Thus, the joint probability is 50%. In general, given a data set, discriminative models learn the boundary between classes, whereas generative models model the distribution of individual classes across the entire data set. They accept no boundaries, boss status. A generative model models both the features and the class. If we model the probability of X and Y, we can use this distribution to generate data points. All algorithms that can model the probability of X and Y are generative, and we'll talk about a few of those examples in a second. If we had a data set of song audio files and their associated genre labels, we could build a discriminative model to learn the conditional distribution of the data so that in the future, given a song, we could predict its genre. A generative model, more interestingly, could, given the genre, generate a related song. There are three main types of generative models these days, autoencoders, adversarial networks, and sequence models. Autoencoders attempt to generate an output that's the same as the input. They compress the input into a lower dimensional representation called the hidden space. It's called hidden because it's compressed data, not because of some ancient secret. Then they attempt to reconstruct the output from this representation. We'd use two neural networks here, an encoder network that learns the probability of the hidden space given the input, and a decoder model which learns the probability of the input given the hidden space, which will reconstruct the input as the output. Adversarial networks involve a generator model that learns the probability of X given the learned hidden space H, where X is the input, and a discriminative model which learns the probability of Y given in X, which tries to associate an input instance X to a yes-no binary answer Y about whether the model generated was a genuine sample from the data set we were training on or not. The counterfeiter versus the detective, and both improve over time. The counterfeiter is what will help us generate the data set we need. How bittersweet. And let's not forget sequence models. These models learn the probability of 
the form Y given a specific location in the sequence and a given input sample. As an example, we can consider each word as a series of characters, each sentence as a series of words, and each paragraph as a series of sentences. The output Y could be the sentiment of the sentence. Using a similar trick from autoencoders, we can replace Y with the next item in the series of the sequence, namely Y equals X plus one, allowing the model to learn. Let's now go through how these models work in practice. First, I found this really cool Google Colab for generating piano songs. Colab, if you don't know, is a way to run Python code in your browser. You can easily train models on a cloud GPU without having to install anything. Python beginners rejoice. In this collab, we can play with a pre-trained generative model to make it do several things. We can generate an entire piano performance. We just need to select which key we'd like it to be in. And given some initial notes, we can generate the rest ourselves. We can even generate an accompaniment for a given song. You can imagine how we could download this pre-trained model and use it inside of a web or mobile app to serve people. We could create a music making tool for artists or a music collaboration social network, or we could just generate our own unique theme song without needing to hire a professional. The team at Google made this possible by using a type of sequence model that's very popular lately called the transformer model. Their whole process was pretty clever, starting with how they generated the data set to learn from. They started with a collection of YouTube videos that all had a license allowing for their use. Then they used a model to classify those videos that only contained piano music nothing else. Their classifier was trained on AudioSet, an audio dataset that contains over 600 event classes and a collection of over 2 million 10 second sound clips drawn from YouTube videos. Hopefully not ASMR videos though. Super useful dataset by the way, they use its piano data to learn the sound of piano music in general, no matter the order of the notes, and collected hundreds of thousands of piano music videos as a result. They then converted those audio waves into symbolic mid-eye format, which represents musical notes digitally. Within 10k hours of symbolic piano music, there is more than enough for a machine to learn how to play the piano. The transformer network has an encoder and a decoder. It's a sequence model. Input a sequence of notes, and it outputs a sequence of generated notes. In terms of what that collection of specific matrix operations in both the encoder and decoder do, that's way too much to fit into this video, but they, they are just math operations. Different combinations have been tested by AI researchers before coming to this conclusive ordering, because this is the one that gave them the highest accuracy scores. They built the model using Magenta, using its various operations to build these matrix operations, step by step. Linear algebra makes life worth living. Magenta is a collection of musical tools built on top of TensorFlow. It's got pre-trained models that make it really easy to generate music. It's learning the probability distribution of a music data set over time. This is the learning process. Now, if we wanted to, instead of generating music, generate an image, say, of different types of faces, how are we gonna learn that probability model? We'll need to give a machine a set of facial features and see if it can generate a unique face in that style. I found a collab that lets you do just that. No need to type in any code at all. Give the image a starting face and have it transform into another over time, or give it some initial starting features and have it generate faces. It's better than drugs, it's machine learning. It's using a ProGAN or Progressive Growing Generative Adversarial Network. NVIDIA released one of the coolest papers ever when they announced it. It takes the idea of a GAN, but introduces a unique training technique for it. They progressively grow the size of both the discriminator and generator networks. They are mirror images of each other and grow in synchrony. New layers are added to the networks over time while it's training on an image dataset. They train it on the Celeb A image dataset set a collection of celebrity facial images. As the resolution increases in the code, you can see that it adds more convolutional layers in a loop nested inside the function used to build each network. That's a pretty clever trick. Convolutional layers are matrix operations that tend to perform well with image data. Thanks, Jan. 
This reduces the training time. It's two to six times faster depending on the final output resolution. We could imagine that we could use this kind of technology to create a talking head video that can give a weekly educational video lecture on YouTube, generating mouth movements frame by frame. Wait, maybe I should just automate my own job. Nah, I love doing this too much. Clearly, transformer networks are pretty good at learning a probability distribution for musical data, and ProGANs are pretty good at learning a probability distribution for images. But what if we wanted to generate 3D objects? Well, I found a really cool collab that allows for style transfer for 3D objects. Basically, you give the network a 3D object and a related image, and it'll generate a new 3D object that's in the shape of the input and the style of the related image. What a cute little paper demon bunny. How it does this is by using a convolutional network to extract both the style and the content into separate representations. The style represents the textures and colors, whereas the content is the 3D coordinate collection. And through the optimization process at every step, an output 3D model is rendered from a random angle from two different locations, the original one and the learned one. The content loss optimizes the approximate positions of the pixels, whereas the style loss approximates the visual patterns without regard to the positions. Together through gradient descent, it achieves a generated object. This probability model we learned, the probability of X and Y, where X is a 3D object and Y is the style image, outputs some gorgeous visualizations that we can play with inside of the collab. I think I'm in love. The way that they implemented this is by using a really pretty library called Lucid by the creators of Distill. It allows for some cool transformations. With Lucid, you can visualize all the learned features inside of a neural network and implement various style transfer applications. One of the best documented GitHub repositories I've ever seen. Definitely check it out. As for 3D datasets, we could use ObjectNet 3D by Stanford University, which is pretty good. We could generate new types of characters for 3D videos video games as a service for developers or small companies. We could also generate all sorts of fashion accessories, giving the customer the utmost personalization for their own specific style, or have it automate interior design work. I've added the link to all three of these web demos in the video description for you to play with and find some inspiration from. There are three things to remember from this episode. You can generate data if you learn the joint probability distribution of a data set. Generative models are capable of doing this for lots of data sets out there. And some examples of generative models are adversarial networks, transformers, and convolutional networks. 